Terror attacks and plots rising across the globe. We now know the deceased suspect in that Berlin Christmas market rampage was an asylum seeker. And that has President-elect Donald Trump reminding us of his campaign promise to ban immigration from terror hotspots and anyone who cannot be fully vetted. Would that help protect us from future attacks? Hi everyone, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. I'm Lauren Simonetti in for Brenda Butner. Our Bulls and Bears this week, Gary B. Smith, Jonas Max Ferris, John Layfield, along with Deneen Borelli and Chuck Rocha. Welcome to all of you. John, is Trump right that we should ban refugees from terrorist areas, refugees that we cannot fully vet? I agree that why would we bring anybody into our country that we cannot fully vet? And we cannot fully vet these people. Look, there's not biometric data. There's not a library in Aleppo we can, Aleppo we can go check. There's not a, a courthouse in Syria. They've all been bombed out. There's no way to actually vet these people. And if you want to really help the refugees, understand this. Last year we brought in, we relocated 70,000 refugees. We're the leading relocator in the UN Refugee Relocation Program. It cost us $1.1 billion, $17,000 per refugee. Now, if you look at the United Nations website, last year was the highest year of displaced people in the world in history, 65.3 million people. Now compare that to 70,000. That is one-tenth of one percent. 99.9 percent are still out there. We're doing this just to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. We're not helping that many people. It is a multiple of the number of people we can help if we simply send that money overseas, help the refugee camps, and help them go into their right. existing uh, countries around them instead of bringing them here. Gary B, let me ask you, what would a ban look like? Well, I, first of all, Lauren, it's nice seeing you a few hours uh, later than we <laughs> normally uh, speak with each other. Right, so I know. So welcome to the show. And of course, you're in your uh, warm environment. Look like? I, you know, it, it, it's difficult to say because he says, look, I want to, you know, do a little bit more vetting or the only uh, let in people that I can vet. But I think it's really the wrong question with all due respect. You know, Trump is, we, we don't know if any kind of immigration plan, vetting, super vetting, whatever, will help hurt you know i'm sure jonas will maybe point out the flip side mm -hmm. maybe the economics where it actually might hurt tourism and things like that that's beside the point i think what trump is showing is exactly what obama should have shown that a this is a problem b people are worried c mm -hmm. he's being proactive he, but is this religious is showing is this in one religious, word scary or is it more terrorist related Say your question again, Lauren. Is this religious, though? Is this a, a religion it, ban? No, I don't think it's a religion ban. I think it's a terrorism ban. I think Trump is immune to what religion is. He just wants to keep the bad guys out. And I right. think that's why, in, in, in many respects, he was voted in for president. Because people want to see action. They want to see pro-action. Yeah. Trump is saying, look, I'm concerned about this. This is what I think is going to work. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but he, at least he's showing leadership, and I think that's what the American public is responding to. I hope this is the right solution. I don't know if it is, but at least he wants to do something, and that's what this past administration was not right. doing. Tons of action. He hasn't even officially started yet. <laughs> we can only imagine what happens uh, in the new year. Um, but as we talk about vetting, Deneen, is this a threat in a way by the president-elect to push those Middle Eastern countries to do more? So they step up to prevent the bad guys from coming here? Well, sure. The, the Middle Eastern countries should do more. And listen, the United States government, their primary role is the safety and security of Americans. And we can't possibly vet the wave of refugees that would like to come to America. I say we create the safe zones uh, and give them the hope that they could also someday return back home. Because in some cases, I don't even think some of them want to come right. here. So keep them over there. Provide them the safe zone and I think that's the best course of action. So you say keep them there but Chuck let me ask you this what about the terror that we're seeing from people born here what do you make of that? I think that that's the latest tactic by ISIS. You're going to see, see more and more of that. They're looking for people here who are disenfranchised, people who are looking to create havoc here on our own soil who believe it or not we're born here and are Americans but I think when we talk about the vetting if we can figure out how to put a cell phone in my watch we can figure out the vetting I think John also makes a great point when he talks about there's not even a courthouse there let's also not broadly stroke too much across all the lines when it comes to asylum because we are set up and we are a beacon of hope and they're like 
children in Central America who came here years ago because they were being raped and tortured. It makes that we have a place for them to come to to be a safe haven. Nobody wants terrorists. Nobody wants people who wants to come to our, our country to harm us, but we should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah, but yet the terrorists keep coming in. Jonas, there's this idea. It started after 9-11, a national registry. Do you think President-elect Donald Trump would revive that as president? He's going to do something on this because it's such a strong issue for him. And look, I, I think there's not that they're incorrect, the other guess. If you kept out people for a specific religion, or from being from a specific part of the world where there's a lot of terrorists, you could definitely save lives, first of all. Let's start with that. I think you would definitely save lives. You would stop economic havoc. And I also think it would offend some people, but that wouldn't exceed the debt. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of stuff the government could do by overreaching that saves lives. They could mandate you have to wear a life preserver to go in the ocean. That would save lives. They could make all cars <laughs> yeah. have to have breathalyzers to start. That would save thousands of lives. If school buses had to have breathalyzers, if airplanes had to. There's a lot of, my point is, the government can stop you from hurting yourself and other people from hurting you with a lot of regulations and rules. But it might cause more damage to your personal freedoms mm -hmm. and also the economy because let's not forget that, look these people are floating all around Europe Europe didn't do that decades ago to let people move around so easily without passport checks because it was touchy-feely or some liberal mm -hmm. agenda it's to make more money moving goods and services around the world freely is good for the economy when you remove that whether through tariffs or right. checkpoints or certain countries you're gonna do more damage probably than the actual damage of these attacks that you see but, Deneen, vetting is different than regulating, is it not? Well, vetting, again, we, we need to know who these individuals are coming into our country. And the terrorists have already made it clear that they are milling around with refugees to try to get into the United States. And I think we should learn a lesson from Germany. It's not working in Germany. Look what just happened just this week. Uh, so it's uh, something, again, it's the federal government's, government's responsibility for the safety and security of Americans first. And then we help others. John, there's this talk now that border agents are vetting social media pages because oftentimes these terrorists or potential terrorists are radicalized and, and they and they plan their attacks online how do you hold facebook and twitter responsible i don't i think they have an opportunity to to be a private business which they are they're publicly traded but private as in are not government business i think they have an obligation though when you have some type of heinous act or you have some type of terrorist act they to take it off of their website but past that i think you have a hard time finding fault i, I want our guys tracking these guys and remember these guys are vetting terrorists they're not vetting the the muslims or people of muslim religion otherwise we would have had to vet southern christians after the clan problem in the south uh, in the early 1900s or we have to vet the Catholic Church because of problems they had with the South American Native Americans. I mean, this is not a religious issue. This is, I hope it's not. This is a terrorist issue. And people coming from South America, like my friend Chuck said, that's different when people show up at our doorstep and need asylum as compared to us going to a war zone where we cannot vet these people and flying them over here to our country. Thanks, everybody. And Cavuto on business in about 20 minutes from now. Hey, Neil, what do you have coming up? Hey, Lauren, President-elect Donald Trump already negotiating with big government contractors. But is this more about negotiating with Democratic lawmakers? We're going to explain. Plus, why families of some terror victims are now suing some tech icons. See you soon. Thanks, Neil. We'll definitely be watching. But up here first, lots of young adults aren't traveling to visit their parents this holiday week because a record number of them never moved out. But some here say that's actually a good thing and they'll explain next all right you think this one would be awful news 40 percent of young adults in the u.s living with their parents or another family member by the way that's a 75 year high but gary b you say that this isn't necessarily a bad thing explain yourself exactly exactly lauren look i guess i'm uh, on this panel the subject matter expert because i have a my younger daughter, who, uh, and I'm dating myself, is really not much younger than you, Lauren, is actually <laughs> living with us. So I guess on the, the bad news is she had, when she graduated college, she had to kind of reinvent herself and go back to graduate school. The good news is, look, she's saving money. She's getting her meals paid for. You know, we're not charging her rent or any of that stuff. So that's good. I think it bonds the family together. It saves her money. It's actually kind of nice having her here. And the good news across America, homes 
even uh, versus 1983 are about 50 percent larger. So families can actually have more people in there. I think it's probably a net positive. Multi-generational living is certainly the trend. And by the way, Gary, I'm about a decade older than your daughter, but thank you. I didn't just say that. <laughs> nah, uh, not quite. <laughs> so, Deneen, uh, Gary's daughter is not lazy. But often these millennials are lazy. They have a lack of drive, and that's why they're living in their parents' basements. Kids these days, you Kids know, these listen, days. I, I think there are different uh, uh, categories here. Are, are they working hard and trying to save so that they can move out, or, or are they being a slug? But listen, speaking personally, I left home in my early 20s. I went to the school of figure it out because I lived <laughs> in basement apartments. I made the makers of ramen noodles very profitable, and I took the scenic route to get to where I am today, and I'm darn proud of it. Hey, that scenic route <laughs> took you to a, a great place. Uh, you know, Chuck, I got to ask you, as we try to figure this out, or the younger generation tries to figure it out, it's not so easy for them to get a job that they can make, you know, quick buck with here and there because so many of those jobs are either outsourced or computerized, and the robots are now taking over. It's not that easy to get a job. It's a different time for sure. You know, I grew up here in East Texas and I'm home in Texas for the holidays. And the plant I used to work in here when I turned 19, where I went to work right out of high school, now sits in China. And John, I know you're going to ask me, don't worry, I've already been to Whataburger. Everything is just fine. <laughs> Everything's going to be good here. Now, my grown son has moved back home. Now, he had three jobs before he finally come back home and, and kind of... To Gary B's point, he was resetting his life as well, and I'm glad to be there for him. We're happy to have him. But I asked my mama last night if she'd ever had to go back home, and she didn't because she'd got a job at Levi Strauss factory that, again, is no longer there. It's a different time, and I think we have to address the college debt problem and because I, I really think that's going to be the housing bubble of the next generation. I think it has to be addressed. It has to be addressed quickly. Jonas, so you, are you, your argument, I, I believe, would be that kids these days should be less worried about the fancy vacation, that experience about the newest iPhone, and they should just suck it up and get that small, dark, tiny, cheap studio. I don't want to dismiss the student loan bill of goods they were sold that left many people with a debt burden they can't handle. That's true. But I also want to say there's a major difference between baby boomers and millennials. Jack Kerouac didn't go across the country in his parents' minivan, okay? The bottom line is there's a whole country that's cheap to live in. The six places you want to live with all the coffee bars that's expensive, you'll so get out of there and move to Detroit. You know, you have no adventure anymore. You know, Paul Mitchell was started by a guy in his car. There are places to live, get some roommates, crash at someone's couch and get out of your parents house just because it's, you can't afford their nice a house at 22 or 25 or 30 doesn't mean you should spend your life there this is a great economy get out and make it work for yourself and maybe mom and dad need to toughen up a little bit too and say get out of here right now they feel bad they feel bad because they know this john they know that their kids are likely saddled with student debt the average loan now when you graduate thirty thousand dollars right housing prices Yes, in some cities, but in most of the country have gone up. Rents have gone up. It's tough to get a mortgage, and it's hard to get a job that pays well. So, John, I ask you, what's the, what's the fix, and what does this say about the economy? Well, it says in the economy that we haven't seen wage growth really since about 1999. And I think that's why a lot of kids are living in a home. And when you see uh, kids that actually have parents and have a home to go back to, a lot of kids don't. So they should be thankful for that. Uh, the problem I have with millennials is the fact they're so fragile. They need safe zones and they all think they should get participation trophies. It, it may hurt uh, reproduction per, uh, percentages if these kids are all living with mommy and daddy. But I think it's a sign of the financial times we're in. I guess that's why they call them snowflakes, right, Gary? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And by the way, Lauren, yes. my daughter actually did my she did a stint after college, so she's actually a little closer to your age than you might think. Oh, okay. Well, I would love to yeah. meet her one day. And you're a good dad, <laughs> Gary. Thanks for not Thank charging you. her rent and supporting her. Thanks, guys. Cashing in just over an hour from now. Eric, what do you guys have coming up? Hi, Lauren. Donald Trump immediately calling the attacks in Berlin and Turkey terror. Why, this could be a sign we're about to get serious about beating radical Islamic terrorism once and for all. The Cash and crew will see you at 1130. Thank you, Eric. We'll certainly be watching. But up here first, little outrage from the mainstream media after Ivanka Trump is harassed on a plane. If it happened to Chelsea Clinton, someone here says it would be on the front pages everywhere. How's this for a Merry Christmas? Ivanka Trump and her husband and kids getting berated by a passenger on a JetBlue flight. The passenger was escorted off the plane before takeoff. 
but there's little outrage among the mainstream media. Deneen says if this were President Obama or Hillary Clinton's family, the outrage from the left would be deafening. Oh, well, it would be all day for weeks to come, Lauren. And listen, the uh, intolerance and the anger really is coming from the left. And I think I see this as a double standard as well. And look at the irony here. Uh, the left for since the election, even after the election, have been saying that Donald Trump supporters are angry, white, unemployed men. And here we have a guy who's a lawyer. He's educated. And educated educated white guy acting like this, intolerant and belligerent. It's just really outrageous. John, if this were a, Democrat, a Democrat's family on that plane, would they feel protected from the outrageous uh, I passengers? Or, I don't know if they would or not, because I don't know if uh, Ivanka felt protected or not. Her husband didn't do anything. The Secret Service was there. So obviously they didn't feel like this was going to escalate. She was obviously well protected. I don't think that's the issue. The issue to me is this was as despicable and cowardly an uh, act as could possibly happen. This is a woman sitting there with her children, and this person confronted her like this. Uh, I can tell you with certainty that if this happened in East Texas, my friend Chuck Rocha will tell you, the least of their worries would be getting thrown off that plane. Yeah, so, ch so Chuck, l let me go to you with that one. What would happen if this happened in Texas? And I'll ask you a second question after you answer the first question. Um, any speculation, not that it matters, why was she flying commercial rather than private? Look, just about the time I don't like anything to do with the Trumps, this happens, right? So I was on a treadmill this morning working off that Whataburger from last night, and I did see it on lots of other news shows other than the right media. But I will say this, it showed her on the airplane in the middle seat in coach. Now, I disagree with everything Donald Trump does on the most part and most of the things that his family has done. But she is in the back of coach with her yep. family, minding her own business, and nobody should be messing with her. If you want to <laughs> protest what's going on and hold your government accountable, have your protest, all my listeners, Liberal friends, go out and raise heck and do all. But you, it's off limits when you start talking about the family. And John has yeah. heard me say, you don't want to get my redneck up because this is a family <laughs> show. And if you go to messing with my children, it's going to get ugly and ugly quick. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Not only was she in the middle seat, by the way, she had her hair okay. up, no makeup on. I loved it. I'm like, that's how I fly too, Ivanka. Go, Ivanka. Uh, Gary B., how is it that, you know, uh, Sasha and Malia Obama were protected because daughters of a, of a Democratic president, but also young children. Ivanka's children, Donald Trump's grandchildren, are young, too, and they were on that flight, and they were subjected to that. Gary? Well, you know, Chuck summed it up pretty much, except for the latter part where he was kind of outraged. He said he disagrees just reflexively, which is idiotic, with everything Trump has done. Because I think, Chuck, if we went back through, Trump's already done some pretty darn good things, some noble things, some leadership things. But no, the mainstream media reflexively hates everything Trump does. And if there's anything bad that is done to him or his family, they look the other way. You said at the top of this segment, if this had happened to the Obama kids or Chelsea Clinton or any one of them, my gosh, going back to the, the Johnson kids, the Kennedy kids, they would have been outraged. They would have had to been forced to wear a scarlet letter. Chuck Schumer would have caused that would have been calling for JetBlue to be shut down. There would have been congressional hearings on the whole airline industry. This would and instead they just looked the other way. Oh, well, you know, it's Ivanka Trump. She can take care of herself. That's the that's the real uh, disgusting part of this whole thing. Disgusting. Jonas. Yeah, first, Did Ivanka Trump acted like the class that she is, but let's not. She was in the extra leg room seat, so that's like another $50 on top of the coach ticket. So let's not act like she's one, she's one of the people. I will also say it really hurts me that the left has co opted what I consider primarily a Republican thing because when you talk about family smears, this goes back to Billy Carter. They did it to their own party with McCain's baby, and Chelsea Clinton hasn't been attacked for everything. They said she faked her pregnancy to get their mother to look more like a grandma or whatever there's this goes back so far obama's wife who seems to be a decent lady she gets smeared all the time so i am sad that liberals would do this when the family is supposed to be off limits as obama has said thank you to deneen and chuck for joining us and coming up gary b's christmas gift for man's best friend that might make him your best friend for life time for predictions john what's your prediction I think fracking continues its boom under President-elect Trump. Flotech has one of the most environmentally friendly fracking solutions. I own it. I think it's up 20% a year. Gary B., what do you think about Flotech? Uh, I like the company, but let's wait in the, for the first 100 days to see what Trump actually does. What's your prediction? 
Well, you know who always gets a Christmas gift, Lauren, other than you? <laughs> it's Charlie here. Charlie always gets a gift. Pets are big pets. The stock is up 30% in 2017. All right, from one Charlie to another. Joni, what's your prediction? People with two dogs have never heard of that company. Uh, I will tell you, I can't think of better promotion for JetBlue than Ivanka Trump being on a JetBlue flight. I was like, what? She's on a JetBlue flight? That is, that's our Princess Diana right there. I say JetBlue up 20% in a year. That's what Ramon thinks, and so does Charlie number two. Two Charlie dogs today. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah. The Cost of Freedom, the number one business block on television, continues with Neil Cavuto now. President-elect Donald Trump putting corporate America on notice from Boeing to Lockheed Martin to Carrier. It's a dance, you know, it's a little bit of a dance. But we're going to get the cost down and we're going to get it done beautifully. And your conversation with Boeing seemed to produce some positive results? I think so. We had uh, the chairman of Boeing, CEO, and I think we're looking to cut a tremendous amount of money off the press. And I said to some of the folks, I said, companies are not going to leave the United States anymore without consequences. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Cue the Sopranos music. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto. <laughs> Merry Christmas to each and all. You know, this week, the president-elect sending out another message to big business. His holiday season, no less. It's not about you, he seems to be saying. And in the case of government contractors, more like the taxpayers funding you. Something the Democrats should like to hear and should make them more open to presumably addressing sacred spending cows of their own. So it got me wondering, it happens sometimes, if this is part of Donald Trump's art of the deal, to get Democrats making deals with him. To Charles Payne, Charlie Gasparina, we have Heath Herzog with us, along with Ben Stein and Jessica Tarloff. Adam Lashinsky and Kennedy are at a rally right now, so they couldn't join us. <laughs> All right, Charles Payne, do you... And on this, I think there's a certain brilliance to this, and I'm wondering if I'm, I'm layering the intentions a bit more than I should, but it has the right effect, right? It certainly has the right effect right now uh, with all the names that you just mentioned. Listen, here's the thing, too. First of all, he's taken on sacred cow, cows of the Republican Party. Right. Uh, I mean, the defense. We're talking about he's taken defense head on. No one ever touched defense before. Then he's putting him in this harsh spotlight, the glaring spotlight, and the world is watching him negotiate with them in open. It is really putting them on the heels. When the CEOs of Lockheed Martin and, and Boeing this week stepped out of Mar-a-Lago, they were both like their tails between their legs. One I talked, though, the other didn't. The CEO well, of Lockheed Martin just she hurriedly left the scene, which leads me to believe that that one didn't go. So what happened the next day? The next tweet. We're going to have Boeing look into perhaps the exactly. F-18 going against the F-35. Lockheed Martin stock gets hit. So, yeah, you know, you'll talk now, you'll talk real soon. But I think that the end result of this in D.C. is less horse trading, uh, less drawn out dramatic, uh, you know, sort of uh, negotiations, if you will, and perhaps more, more resolution, more so solving problems rather than... But it's that them. way about solving the problem that worries you, right? Well, it's kind of like another episode of The Apprentice, you know, only, you know, now it's the, the presidential version. Listen, I'm all for getting down the cost of, of, of defense contractor budgets, you know, why not? Uh, but there's, you know, and, and yeah, it's nice that he's engaging with major companies, I guess, to a certain extent, but it, there's a synthetic feel to this thing. More and historically, presidents have never been in a contract negotiation yeah. with the Defense Department. So I think this and these is were a done contracts, right? I mean, these they were done signed contracts. and sealed. But he's more or less putting everyone on notice. They're they're, they're not complete with me, and uh, and it's sending a signal out. To anyone, any contractor, this game stops. Listen, that's I, so bad? I usually don't agree with Charlie, but in this case, I have to. I think that this is really a good point. He, you, you feel guilty a, about that? A little bit. It's, I get it's, a, little it's dirty. a guilty pleasure. Yeah. Right. I mean, dirty. you know what? He he um, he is doing something very different now. Uh, Charlie you know, I or, or Donald Trump? Well, Charlie too, I think. Are you no. doing something different? I've been, I've been no. beating up on Trump for the entire. Campaign. No, and I, I agree. Me too. Right. However, I think this is actually maybe this is what we need so, to you know to go up against these business titans in such a public forum to show everyone else, hey, listen, I, I'm really about making this work out. I'm really about economy is first. And it's not and as it's unprecedented. It. I mean, presidents, I, this is the first president-elect that I know of, Ben Stein, but presidents have often used the bully pulpit to get what they wanted with his Teddy Roosevelt, I think. Obviously, John Kenney used it to go after the steel industry, price hikes. Uh, Ronald Reagan used it in another sense to go after air traffic controllers and striking when he said they couldn't. So they make these powerful statements to make a, a big 
a big statement. Uh, is this well, that? I, my, my concern is this. I'm not really concerned with him getting the price of these things down. Obviously, we want the price to be reasonable, and there is an enormous layer of bureaucracy that fights, fights, fights with the defense contractors to get the price down. I want our fighting men and women to have the very best weapons they can. Yep. I don't want the idea to be a bargain price. I don't want the idea to be a cut price. I want them to have the very best weapons they can when they go into combat. And if their weapons cost a little bit more, even if they cost a lot more, I'd rather have that than than have Donald Trump cutting the price of them. I well, I think there's room to cut here, right? I think yeah. we have the it's best a four point two billion world, dollar Air way Force One than contract. The price. I don't know, but I understand where you're coming. But Jessica, my view here is I think there's room to cut. If you've ever worked with a contractor yeah. at all, I mean, you know, they, they you you build in that it's it, you're going to be lowballed and then it's going to go up, and and you, it's just a given. And in Washington, I think it's been accepted as a given. Absolutely. I mean, this is what the Coburn Waste Book was fundamentally about, right? All these things that government is spending money on that we shouldn't be. And at the end of the day, Donald Trump is now the federal government, as it were, or he will be in, on January 20th, and he's acting like a smart consumer here, right? I mean, I hate to uh, agree with this kind of uh, Trumpian But do you think it'll process, get Democrats then to look at uh, sacred cows of their own, if it were entitlement spending, maybe to slow the growth of it, or to be open to that? To, to, in other words... To get everyone going after the same goal of, 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 of having a productive government. I think so. I mean, I think Democrats are acutely aware of the fact that we are in the minority here, and now we don't even have the president anymore. So right? Democrats are going to roll on Social Security no, 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 no. and all that? No, I no don't way. think they're going to roll. And it, it'll be interesting what close. Tom Price comes back with and says, you know, we're just going to Listen. privatize Medicare, et cetera. But I think that we know that we have to compromise, especially if we want a trillion well, dollars in infrastructure not, spending. Charles Schumer is not talking about compromise. We should point well, out on those very key issues. I would just say this. In the Coburn book that you mentioned, did they talk about the F-16s being overpriced? or the F-35s? No. no. I mean, I mean, my point is, I'm, I just wonder, I have no problem with the president going out there and, and talking down defense budgets and things of that nature. My point is, is this real? Is it show? It, it, part of it is show, but is it real? I mean, I think, are they really screwing us? Look, is Boeing, no, I think, is, I think all due respect, respect, ben, with, do all think respect Gaspo, with, with all due respect, Gaspo, with your ne without your necktie and everything, the president-elect campaigned on a promise of greatly increasing defense spending, and there's nothing wrong with that. We are way but under you're making now my point. for the threats we face all around the world. I don't think the priority is to cut defense no, spending, it's ben, to increase ben, defense you're, spending. You're, you're making my point. I mean, he, he campaigned on that, but I want to know, in reality, you know, are these defense co contractors, you know, are they really ripping us off like he says I they think are? they are. I think well, they are. Listen, Air Force One contract. But Charles Payne, I know you broke these numbers down as well, but this Air Force One contract started about $2 billion. It blew to $4.2 billion. Now, maybe they were adding a lot of stuff to it, like, I don't know, wheels on the plane. But the fact <laughs> is that that's outrageous. Now, I, I know people tell me to do contract work. That's the nature of the beast. Right. Maybe he's just saying that's beastly. That's bad. And it's going to stop. I think it's how these numbers balloon that can be fixed. And that's where they rip the, the, the American public off. They come in with low ball offers that right. they know they can never achieve. Once they secure the contract, they can go four, five, six years late and add billions and billions of no. dollars. And just that's right. so, no, so, no, the know, system itself. Do we know they're the ripping system. us off? Exactly. No, so how much of this is actually show and how much of the actual know? stuff that he's going to get done? I mean, well, we're talking about a reality star. We just went to a contract. If someone tells you they're going to build a house for you for 200 grand, takes a while. Well, I agree with you, And then it ends up costing a million and you got it four years later. Sometimes you say, I got the show on Twitter. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think anybody in this, in this panel is a real expert at defense contracting. Is you, you, you guys they keep saying off? they're ripping us off, ripping us off, ripping us off. We don't know if they're ripping us That's off. That's my Look, point. We suffered terribly in a number of wars because our weapons That's are not my good point. enough. I don't want that to well, happen again. Well, how do you know again. they're not ripping us well, off? Well, here's the man. thing I'm saying. I'm, let me... Well, we can't really have much I will discussion. say this much, guys. We know we know Washington, D.C. is notorious for, for instance, building weapons that admirals and generals say they don't want. Big giant tanks that Absolutely will sink true. in the sand right. of the desert. Really? The yeah. They, they, because I think in the, almost any government. Because their job is to prune. bring home the right. bacon. There's room to prune. Yeah, but this, but is it, but, but what I'm saying is, yes, there's room to improve and, you know, do I something about it. Prune. Do, See, I do I room to prune. Do room to improve and prune. <laughs> but I am telling you, what, what, where is the, where is the empirical evidence that Boeing and, and Lockheed are ripping us off? There is none. He's exactly. just calling them in and breaking exactly the chops. Right. He's, he's using exactly his right. builder, uh, 
uh, you know, July? wherewithal. To, he's never we built don't know if jet airplanes. I mean, he's pitting bitters against one another. Like, the like 15 con contract seems high to me. Uh, if you have something a, similar, Boeing, actually, you he's can not dish doing up. that. He's, he's, he's calling them in after the fact and saying, "We, be I believe, me, Donald Trump, what's wrong with that? who's a branding expert, what's believes that? that you defense contractors are ripping us off." So you would, you like Ben, who I love dearly, you would blindly continue to get no, the defense. No, I would not blindly agree with Donald Trump. I would, I would say, the fact, is it true? He's trying to cut the fat. How do you know? Well, be Where's okay. the fat? Because it is over oh, over the course on. of the last 20 years, Char Charlie, they have, we have been known that the Everyone in government, in every aspect of government, government, it's time for a well, full accounting Well, then change the procurement process. Don't call them in willy-nilly. Oh, change I the procurement. Oh, I would call everybody in willy-nilly. Really? And you should, And you will get nothing <laughs> done. I have a top-to-bottom study <laughs> of, like, expenses around here. you got to see my All expense right, account. This a fat nap Yeah, you'll be having a house of pancakes. <laughs> budget after I'm done. All right. In the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, in the wake of a lot of these new attacks, can we take terrorists offline by going after their sites that they're using online? Some victims' families say yes, and now they're suing to make the point. All right. With terror attacks mounting, some victims' families are now suing. Three of them in the Orlando terror attack on the Pulse nightclub there are slapping the likes of Facebook and Twitter and Google with a lawsuit claiming that their products are helping ISIS inspire these type of killers. Here's what their lawyer just told me on Fox Business. Are you arguing that those sites tipped it to the crazy, murderous guy he became? What we're saying is that it contributed in part to his actions on that day. Uh, whether it was the sole cause or a partial, you know, contributed, that's something that will be found out down the road. Ben Stein, what do you think of this? I think it's a very good idea to have some restrictions upon incitement to violence. We love freedom of speech. It's wonderful. It's a glorious gift from God. But there's no allowance for shouting fire in a crowded theater. And I don't think there should be any allowance for encouraging people to commit violent acts. And I don't mind at all the idea of uh, the big social media sites being monitored either by themselves or by somebody else to try to crack down on that. Jessica. I agree, actually, with Ben Stein, which I don't think has ever happened before. Um, no, I talked to a friend of mine who... That's the Christmas Merry magic Christmas. of this show. It is show. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah <laughs> and Kwanzaa. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who works at YouTube, actually, specifically on this problem. about you how You have they a friend who works at YouTube? I, I do, because I'm cool. cool and hip and liberal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I know people at National <laughs> yeah. She was saying that, you know, they have tons of people on this, and but yeah, every yeah. minute there are hundreds of thousands of hours of content uploaded. So they, they can't track it fast enough to make sure that they can get it down. down. And we know that ISIS puts videos up all the time uh, that way. So this is an incredibly steep challenge for these uh, social media companies. But they've, they've got to do it. And I think this lawsuit will hopefully spur them into further action. We have to find a way to prevent this, especially I, with all I these worry, little wolves. And I, I'm sounding like this leftist alarmist here. It's but not I bad. Just You'll really far, like it. <laughs> I worry Heath, how far it goes, though. It, here's the issue. We're talking about regulation, and we've talked about that a lot here. But there's a Section 230 of the Federal uh, Community... The Communication Decency Act, which basically protects all of these online social media sites. What what point do we stop regulating so much to the point where we can't even protect our own people? That's what the problem is. When we are disseminating bigoted information all over online, on the interwebs, people are believing it like it's truth and then starting to act on it. That's problematic. And then well, Where do you draw the, the line? The ones who act on it violently or the ones who take it as gospel truth and vote accordingly? Uh, the, I mean, <laughs> people who act on it violently, you know? I mean, we can sit there and argue what is truth and what is not. That's a whole other philosophical But discussion. I'm just saying just be careful what you wish for. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying that we also need regulation. We can't have these companies be so protected yeah. that way. I get way. nervous. What do you think? People are I, I'm, I'm in your – listen, I think – Twitter and, and Facebook have a, a responsibility to not allow people to break the law on their sites, which is, you know, if you advocate violence and killing and terrorism, you are a conduit to breaking the law. You're part, you're party of that. But this whole notion that, you know, you, they should be responsible for every bit of speech that's in there, I mean, is absurd. I mean, listen, there's, there's people that say they killed based on being influenced by the Bible. I mean, are we going to, you know, ban all Bibles? I mean, that's where this gets to be tricky. Uh, they, and, you know, there is a, a sort of legal standard here. 
are, you know, is your site or is whatever, what you're doing, is that being used as a conduit, a specific conduit Charlie, for a specific act? they're not policing act? all things they're saying. They're, they're trying. They, we're just trying to, we're, what we're are you saying, do? if you're doing, you can't if you say are, X, y, and Z? if you are, are disseminating threatening information, when well, you're saying that you're breaking the law. To call, to listen, kill people, what Ben just said before right, holds violence, true. No, ben terrorism. Just said, no, but listen, Ben just said before, you can't yell fire um, improperly in a crowded movie theater. Right. You can't say, let's get together and blow up the World Trade Center. You but can't use something is, as a conduit. If you do that, you will be held accountable by, right. by the well, that's one are saying, we are protected yes. by this law. That's right. right. We are but Charles Payne, no, isn't it going for what this guy, what this lawyer is saying, that is you have a site up there and impressionable people come upon it, that it doesn't matter that 99% of them don't act out what's on that site. For the one guy who does, you got to shut down that site. That's what's dangerous. Yeah, well, the, I think too. It's it's so easy to, to put up a Twitter site. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you could put up ten thousand a day. If they take them down, you could put up another ten thousand the next day. It's a tricky avenue. Obviously, I think they want to enforce the law. I think where a lot of people get upset with social media, though, is that they have been really tough with uh, being social justice warriors in this country for language that they deem a, a dangerous or people who may be advocating just a different political view that they deem a dangerous, point, but they don't point. deem terrorists, it seems like, from time to time, as dangerous as they deem maybe a right-wing conservative uh, talk show host. Yeah. Look at the time. A Fox News alert for you. President Obama blaming Fox News, speak of the devil, for bedeviling him, for his own party's demise. But did these two Joes in his own party just say not so? Today on Forbes on Fox, teaming up to take terrorists down. The urgent call for government and private companies to work together to tear these barbarians apart. Plus, the Forbes new list of best countries for business. And guess what? The U.S. doesn't even make the top 20. Can President-elect Trump's pro-business policies put us back on top? We'll see you at the top of the hour. All right, the president this week continuing to blame Fox News for the election difficulties Democrats are having. That's nothing new, but here's what is. Some members of his own party this time are saying enough. What do you make of efforts still afoot to deny Donald Trump the victory? Well, Neil, I, people just got to get over it and go on. And now another Joe, as in Vice President Joe Biden, blaming his own party, Heatha. What do you make of that? Oh, I think the Democrats need to just shut it and move on. It is, it's Christmas time. Let's move on. <laughs> There's going to be a new president-elect. I mean, it's going to be president in a matter of a couple weeks now. It's over. She, Hillary Clinton ran a terrible campaign. Um, you know, to take a quote from Obama, don't boo, vote. That's what people did. They voted in Donald Trump. That's where we are right now. You know what? If they wanted Hillary Clinton in, they should have gone out, voted. It would have been fine. Jessica, what do you make of the fact that uh, a lot of Democrats aren't saying that, that they're blaming everything but... Uh, uh, maybe uh, a bad campaign or the fact that this was a judgment on Obama's legacy. Mm -hmm. so he himself was saying that before the election, afterwards, anything but. Yeah, no, this is incredibly difficult for President Obama. It was definitely a referendum on the last eight years. And she was also running for the third term of her husband's presidency as well. So that's double difficult, uh, just historically speaking. I understand why this is tricky for President Obama. I mean, he has to be worried looking ahead. What's the future of Obamacare, right? His environmental regulations, things that he's really staked his presidency on. And I understand that, though. I'm going to go with the Joes, though I prefer Biden to Manchin personally, and say we have to move on. We have elections coming up in 2018 and 2020. And I think we can do very well there. There are a lot of issues that Democrats actually do well on. We didn't end up winning, obviously. Um, the Electoral College spoke, right. as it were. Um, but, you know, we're down, but, but we're not out. do well, you have to acknowledge what you did wrong. And if Absolutely. they're not saying they did anything wrong, also... Ben Stein, what do you think of it? I think the Democrats actually ran a very good campaign. Mrs. Clinton is an extremely intelligent woman. She was my schoolmate at Yale Law School, yeah. so I love her for that. But, man, did you go there, too? Well, God bless you. Anyway, no, the, no, I was just but, excited but, but, that but, but, you said the, something nice about Hillary. I didn't go to Yale. I'm not that smart. But I know where Yale but is. The ultra, Does that count? But the ultra-left right. is uh, treating this as if it were some kind of catastrophe. And their behavior is a mental health issue, not a politics <laughs> issue. Yes, the behavior of the ultra-left, like those people... I like, I like what he's Trump saying. They are, they, they, liberals are, liberals, issue. 
there's some kind of mental health problem I with agree. the baby bottle being taken away from the baby <laughs> and the baby yeah, I get screaming. the gist of what you're saying. I think, uh, I think liberals are psychopathic, but uh, I think here's the bottom line. White, um, the Democrats are, have realized that the, the white working class, uh, that they didn't represent the white working class for many years, and they're getting right. scared. Right. Yeah, I disagree with Ben. Hillary ran a terrible campaign because she forgot the very people Charlie Gasparino just talked about. Which is a way of complimenting Charlie Gasparino. Thank and you. Ben at the it's same unsettling. time. It's, right. a, it's a Christmas present. I want to thank Keith. I want to thank Charlie. I want to thank Jessica. All great jobs, guys. Well, if you've been listening to my buddy uh, Charles Payne this year, uh, you're looking at a very Merry Christmas with some picks that were off the charts. He's got some more gifts for you after this. <laughs> Welcome back. I want you to look at all the money that Charles Payne has made you this year. Charles, what are you looking at to top it next year? Uh, CF Industries. I, I love this risk award. I think it's going to be a huge, gi gigantic winner. Uh, Deutsche Bank just got over their mortgage issues. And even though European banks are in some trouble, I think this has a huge upside. And Yelp, finally going to live up to its potential, may have even been taken out at some point in 2017. Those are eclectic picks. Ben, yes. what do you think? <laughs> Well, I love Charles' picks, and I admire him very much, and God bless him for making money, and uh, I hope he moves to my neighborhood very soon. Uh, but uh, I will always go with the indexes, and I'll always go with Mr. Buffett and Mr. Ha and Berkshire Hathaway. Even though, you know, he's had triple-digit gains in, in some of his other picks? Wouldn't you want to just chase uh, God him? bless him. I can always say God bless him. I'll be out in Malibu soon, buddy. All right. I'll see okay, you good. in the we'll book. Look to seeing you there, <laughs> All sir. right. Merry Christmas, everyone. The Cost of Freedom continues now. Crush the terrorists by crushing their money machine. The same week we see a deadly terror attack in Berlin and a man arrested in Virginia for trying to send cash to ISIS. Now a bipartisan House report is calling on President-elect Trump to have the government team up even more with private companies to cut off the terrorist money supply once and for all. Will it work or will it just create more useless bureaucracy? Hi, everybody. Merry Christmas. I'm David Asman. Welcome to Forbes on Fox. Let's go in focus to find out with Steve Forbes, Rich Carl Gard, Mike Ozanian, Sabrina Schaefer, John Tamney, and Bruce Jackson. So, Steve, is this report on the right track? David, it's fine to do more coordination. You can usually do that with an email or a phone call and tell the bureaucrats to get off their duffs and work together. If they're serious about fighting funding for terrorism, cut that money off from Iran from that nuclear arms deal. No more money on that. Cut Iran off from the world banking system. Do the same thing with individual banks in Pakistan and elsewhere. And cut off various individuals we know who are bad guys. They're basic steps, but Iran's the big one. If they're not yeah. doing that, they're not serious. Well, Rich, in addition to Iran, I think Steve's absolutely right, but in addition in addition to that, they're still getting a lot of money from oil, about $500 million a year. We have had attacks on these oil supplies, but not enough. Uh, and there are also a lot of people in the region that are funneling mo money to them, right? Some of our supposed allies. I think every administration, going back to at least the first George Bush administration, knows but doesn't really talk about the fact that Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, their governments are financing uh, these Sunni uh, rebels and uh, which eventually flows into the terrorists. And why do they do that? Uh, because you know the, the, it's a promise that the Sunni rebels won't overthrow these governments, but it comes back to hurt us. So I think that uh, Trump, being a master negotiator, has to negotiate with Saudi Arabia right. and Qatar and use our leverage you know, that we're now entering this cheap energy boom that, hey, we don't need you. We're going to put the thumb on you guys right. now. We'll talk about draining the swamps. There's an example. We'll talk about the swamp in Washington, Mike Ozanian. Here's the, here's the House uh, report. <laughs> and, you know, God bless them. I'm sure they mean well. But, but the specific, specific advice that Steve and Rich just gave isn't in this report. It looks, frankly, like a United Nations report. Dave, unless there's something in there that t talks about taking control of the caliphate, then it's not going to be effective at all. That's why no matter what you do in terms of trying to c cut off their finances, unless you have strong military action, it's not going to be effective. And, and Sabrina, by the way, you also have people here that are trying to send money over there. As I reported in Virginia, they, they caught one guy. And lest people think that this is just an isolated case, you go in to search in the Justice Department website, look for material support, and you find a whole list, dozens of individuals in this country that are sending money or trying to to ISIS. 
Right, and David, I feel like this has been a conversation we've had since September 11th because we knew that people were being funded to to to, um, to initiate these attacks, both and the money was going both ways. The problem is that government hasn't gotten any smaller in the past decade and a half. If anything, it has gotten bigger, it's gotten more bureaucratic and more convoluted. And so I, I worry sometimes that in this approach to sort of um, stamp out terrorism through different parts of government, that we are in somehow um, just entangling things more. We need to be yeah, very right. clear about what the mission is in each case. Well, John Tamney is a, is a big supporter of, of federal reports like this one, right, John? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> without minimizing for a second the horrors of terrorism, what happened this past week in Berlin, this is quite simply not going to work. We know this well in the United States. For decades, the Fed, politicians, they've tried to restrict money flows. Money always reaches its intended target. So we'd empower the federal government even more, and we wouldn't be a lick more safe. Let's stop aggrandizing government. They can't fix this. Well, Bruce. It is the Achilles heel of terrorism, the funding, because without the funding, uh, they can't do much of anything except shout. Uh, is, is there a way to do this? Is there a way to strangle their, their sources of funding? Well, I, I believe there is, and I, I will say that that report looked a, a heck of a lot better in, <laughs> on digitally rather than in print. Um, but I would say that the president-elect needs to take this seriously and move past tweeting about his second place finish in the popular vote here. I mean, it was a bipartisan report, which is a good thing. There's a lot of stuff in there. We have not had a successful, uh, as the president said, a successfully executed attack from a foreign source, so we've done mm. some things right, but I think more coordination and taking it seriously is a good thing, and it's the bipartisan. Steve, one of the problems about coordinating, particularly with the folks overseas, is how badly they have performed this week in, in trying to track down the terrorists. They finally killed the guy, but not before he'd crossed over many borders. Uh, and in fact, Europe's approach to terrorism very often has the opposite effect. Some of the terror suspects who committed the attacks in Paris a year ago and then fled to Belgium were getting a lot of money from the government's welfare funding. So not only did they not keep them out, but they were giving the money to boot. Well, that gets to the whole thing, especially in Europe, is they're in an adequate way of figuring out who's coming in. And when uh, Merkel, a year, a little over a year ago, said she'd take two million refugees, she quickly backed off from it. But if you don't have a way of mechanism of determining who's coming in, you're going to have problems. And this gets to back to Barack Obama, who didn't create a safe zone in Syria, which would have kept those millions of refugees from crossing into Europe and saved us and the world a whole lot of trouble and lives. But, Rich, again, we've had a president these past seven and a half years who, who seems to approach the, the globalist perspective on these things, that we all have to work together. I, frankly, I don't want to work together by the clowns over in Europe uh, that have missed tracking down some of these terrorists. You know, I think the root of the problem with Barack Obama is he lacked the confidence in the fundamental virtue of the United States to, to actually use our leverage in the world, whether it's with China, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran, and I think things will change with Donald Trump. John, what do you think of that? There's a big difference between being anti-murder and actually finding those people. You're looking around the world for, for, the, for the, 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 the tiniest bits of evidence. The idea that any president is going to succeed in stamping out murder seems as right. unrealistic as, as doing well, it in the United Bruce, States. Bruce, one thing that does unite the world <laughs> is money, frankly. It, it doesn't have to do with religion. It doesn't have to do with race. Uh, it, I think if we're going to work together at all, at least in a banking community, they could find ways of squeezing these terrorists, couldn't they? Oh, definitely. And I think when you think about the, what is alarming to me on this whole Russian hacking, I mean, if they're able to, I think people should pay attention and say, if they're able to hack into people's emails, political figures, heads of state, people are going to wake up some morning and see, you know, their, their 401ks disappear. Right, I mean, that's right. what worries me. Right. I knew we'd they get it back to the Russian money. hacking. Steve, final word, quickly. <laughs> final word is get Iran, then they go after the others. Okay, start with Iran. Well, we were once number one, but you're not going to believe where the U.S. has slipped to on the Forbes list of best countries for business. The answer and what President-elect Trump can do to get us back on top coming next. Well, America used to be number one in the Forbes list of best countries for business. But take a look at the new list. We're not in the top 10. We're not even in the top 20. 
We're now all the way down to number 23, right behind Iceland. Rich Carlgard, it's not just costing us our reputation. This is costing all of us a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah, we're a long ways from being in the college football playoffs. Uh, look, <laughs> the economist named Scott Granis defined because uh, uh, after the recession of 2008, we never got back to our 3% plus GDP trend line. It's cost the U.S. $3 trillion of economic activity that was stillborn, and that's why we're number 23 instead of number one. By the way, there's a $3 trillion gap at the top of the chart there. Steve, can Donald Trump get us back on top? Absolutely. You start with a big tax cut. That'll help get the economy moving. Another huge burden is regulations, especially with the EPA, which is the nerve center of the so-called administrative bureaucratic state. And you do something sensible with the Fed and you're on your way. Just avoid a trade war. And these other measures, they will work, especially getting rid of Obamacare. Huge burden on small businesses. Creation of small businesses. Bruce, will tax cuts get us there? Well, I think if they're they're paid for and they uh, do things like he holds to his promise of uh, you know eliminating some things like the carried interest loophole and and gives tax cuts to the middle class who uh, elected him out in middle America perhaps, but he's got to be he's got to take things seriously and start governing and stop tweeting uh, uh, vendettas at people. Sabrina, you know what always gets me when people say a tax cut has to be paid for? By whom is it going to be paid for? It's our right. money. <laughs> tax the cuts are our guys. money. We deserve that cash. It doesn't no. have to be paid for, does it? No, right, exactly, David. You know, I'm actually really encouraged by some of Trump's picks to run a number of the different um, agencies. So, for instance, someone like Puzder, who has been appointed for Department of Labor, this is someone who understands that if we want to get the economy moving again and make it more friendly for business, we can't sort of artificially um, uh, raise the mi minimum wage or we can't necessarily mandate paid leave policies. This is someone who understands that real economic growth comes from allowing businesses to make the decisions that work best for them, and that's going to ultimately help not only employees but consumers as well yeah. so i feel encouraged by some of those picks well and i'm encouraged too but uh, john on the other hand it's amazing how we've gone from number one on that list the the most business friendly country in the world to number 23 that's an that's an embarrassment it's it's an embarrassment, but it's not so amazing when you consider the bad policy of the past 16 years. And so Trump, at least so far, you could say, has taken us in the right direction with tax cuts and deregulation. But there are dangerous signals out there. This week, he appointed Peter Navarro, an avowed protectionist, to a very senior position in the administration. Right. Trump will not be great, nor will the economy be great, if he goes protectionist and anti-dollar. Mm. Watch out. So, Bill, it's not only liberals. A lot of libertarians like John don't... Uh have that much hope for the future. I have hope, and Sabrina's totally right about jobs. We could move a long way up on the rankings just by repealing the laws that smother employers. When you bury yeah. the hiring process in rules, costs, mandates, and litigation, you get less hiring. We could fix that. Well, Rich, what happens if we get the tax cuts, we get the regulatory cuts, uh, but we get into these trade difficulties with China and the rest of the world, could that slow us down? I think Trump has to talk tough on trade because his base wants it. I am, have actually more confidence that behind the scenes there are going to be a lot of bilateral trade agreements and it won't be as bad as John thinks. And Steve, he is a negotiator. Sometimes the things that come out of his mouth are the first step in a negotiating process. Uh, you look at some, not everybody in the team that he's put together so far is anti-trade. You've got people like Wilbur Ross who's trading with China all the time. Uh, well, Wilbur has also made some uh, trade noises, but uh, the key thing is what you actually do. You don't have to tear these things up. There are plenty of uh, remedies in place. And in terms of uh, cyber theft and things like that, I think uh, those things are issues need to be addressed. Bruce, you look at where we have gone. I know you don't think Trump has the right solutions or he hasn't broadcast them yet as, as far as you're concerned. But how do we get back to, to the top spot? We've gone from one to number 23. Well, I think that a lot of the things that you don't like about the, the, what uh, President Obama did had to do with stimulus and so forth and running up the debt and the that deficit. That brought us I mean, down the, to number 23, Bruce. Well, no, I, that's right. And so with tax cuts, if they, they will, a lot of the economists, yeah, a lot of the economists say that they will blow a hole in the deficit. All right. So, Steve, what I do you have a lot of hope tonight. You, you have trust, Steve, in these economists. Well, By the way, these Steve. economists have a reputation of being wrong much more often than they're right. Go ahead. Yeah, they still think they're sun revolves around the earth 
when, when, when it comes to making an economy move. And I'm uh, wonderful that the Democrats are now concerned about the deficit. The way you get rid of a deficit is by a booming economy, a little bit of spending restraint. And you get a booming economy by getting off of people's backs in these crazy regulations and also reducing the burden in terms of taxation. It's always worked. If, take the real world, Bruce. Reduce the burden and people respond. Positively. Sabrina, go ahead. Yeah, and this is, you know, to Steve's point, this is exactly why people shouldn't be crying over this new EPA pick. We should, of course, want a, a clean and healthy environment, but these burdensome regulations are keeping businesses from growing. They are keeping people from finding jobs, and they are destroying huge segments of our economy. So we should be excited about that, and we should be enthusiastic as well about, um, about the potential of repealing and replacing Obamacare. That has been a huge jobs killer. So okay. all of this could help raise our numbers very quickly. We're going to be talking more about the environment coming up. Meanwhile, the cash in gang is getting ready to roll at the bottom of the hour. Eric, what do you got? David, President-elect Donald Trump immediately calling the assassination of a Russian diplomat in Turkey and the attack on the Berlin Christmas market acts of terror. Can that help us finally defeat the terrorists? Plus, MTV sparking outrage for its video telling white guys how to be better people in 2017. See you at 1130. All right, Eric, we will be watching. But up here first, gifts for the greenies. President Obama banning more offshore drilling in the U.S. He says it's to protect the environment, but is he really protecting something else? And speaking of gifts, our informers have their annual stocking stuffers for the boss. A Forbes tradition you don't want to miss. President Obama says he's going to give one more Christmas gift to the environmentalists with a new ban on offshore oil and gas drilling. But in a Forbes flip side, Mike Ozanian says this could end up stuffing our global environmental stocking with dirty lumps of coal. Mike, explain his flip side. David, anybody who wants a clean environment should hate this initiative by President Obama. All this is going to do is give more market share to oil producers who do a much dirtier job than the U.S. companies right. do. And Bruce, uh, we have plenty of examples. Ter terribly dirty oil drilling in Venezuela, and in Ecuador, in Russia, etc. You'd just be giving more market share to the dirty drillers. Yeah, I think he's, he's leading by example by saying this is what we're going to do. We can't control what they do elsewhere. But who's drilling in the Arctic anyway? I mean, all you have to do is look at Shell, and it's been a farce. I mean, it cost them $7 billion and has gone nowhere. Uh, Steve, a farce? Uh, not at all. When you reduce unnecessary regulation, remove these barriers, and the people will be able to do it in a fine fashion. And if they can't make money on it, they won't do it in the first place. Let companies, people who have their money at stake, decide whether these are promising fields or not on land or offshore. Bill, what do you think? I'm all for more drilling, but I don't think we should relax our environmental rules just because the environment's worse somewhere else. By that logic, by Mike's logic, we should have more child labor in the United States because conditions are even worse in Bangladesh. Yeah. But Sabrina, the point is we are so much cleaner than the way they do things elsewhere in the world. Exactly. And if you want a cleaner world environment, you give more market share to the cleaner drillers than the dirty ones, right? I mean, it seems simple. Of course. Of course, we do have all of these regulations. David, I think it's important that people start being grown-ups. Just because something makes you feel good doesn't mean it's good policy. And the fact is, when we prevent, you know, we create these moratoriums on federal land, it just distorts the energy market. It drives up prices. And just to put it in perspective, it takes a company like Marathon 300 days to get a permit right. to, to drill on those, on those lands. It takes them 10 days to get a permit in North Dakota, where the energy market is booming. We have jobs and we have yeah. affordable energy. Well, just so happens. We have a, a no boy from uh, North Dakota here. Rich Carl Garb, what do you think of all this? Well, God bless their incoming governor, Doug Burgum, uh, and the outgoing governor, Jack Dalrymple. Great guys. Uh, Sabrina had exactly right. The Achilles heel of, uh, of the political left is they want credit for good intentions, not right. actual results. Mike, that's mm. the point. I mean, it sounds great. Like all the platitudes from the Obama administration over the past eight years sounds great, a uh, free health care for everybody, et cetera, but the practicality of it is something very different. The left-wing nuts were against Prudhoe Bay oil drilling, too. But since that's opened in 1977, we've gotten 13 billion barrels of oil from it. And the people around there love it. It's the people from the outside, the leftists yeah. that converge on it that are trying to stop that's it. That's a great point. Coming up know. just in time for Christmas, our informers are giving stock picks to the boss himself, Steve Forbes. But will he keep their gifts or dump them like a lump of coal? That's next.
And we'll see you there on Tuesday this week. We're back with our former stocking stuffers for their boss, Steve Forbes, and for you. Uh, Rich Cargar, what do you have for the boss? Marriott, improving economy means more business travel. It's a, it's a name everybody knows, Steve. Is it a stocking stuffer? Well, I love Marriott, but uh, Rich, they're really cutting back on their room service menus. They're really pieces of Ooh. junk now. Whoa! So, uh, you know, uh, they, they got to spruce that up a little bit. Sounds like a lump of coal, Rich. Okay, Mike Ozanian, <laughs> precision drilling. We were just talking about drillers. Th this stock's gotten better, David, the last several years, but I think as oil drilling restrictions get relaxed, this company's going to make a comeback. All right, Steve, what about the driller? This is a low price stock, small cap stock, losing money, but hey, why not? That's the okay. kind of stocks that can rise up. I'll take a chance on that and buy maybe get enough money to get good room service at Marriott. <laughs> buy when it's down and low, so he likes precision. Uh, Bill Baldwin, what do you got? Mattel. I, Barbie was kind of knocked down, but now she's off the mat. Wow, Mattel. What do you think, Steve? It's been a while. By the way, Steve has five girls, so if anybody knows anything about dolls, it's Steve Forbes. Go ahead. Uh, I'm taking this one. I love the fact that uh, Barbie's no longer politically incorrect. She's making a comeback, and the other things Mattel is doing, very, very rich dividend. So, uh, hey, why not? I can buy uh, dolls next year okay. with that dividend. We got an extra 10 seconds for Rich to defend Marriott. Go ahead, Rich. More business travel, you know. Okay. Despite despite bad room service. He's sticking with it. Thank you all very much for joining us. That's it for Forbes on Fox. Have a blessed Merry Christmas. Keep it right here. The number one business block continues now with Eric Bowling and Cashin' In. Calling terrorists what they are, President-elect Donald Trump wasting no time labeling the rampage at a Christmas market in Berlin and the assassination in Turkey, acts of Islamic terror. Supporters saying, unlike the current administration, Trump is blunt and not afraid to call it like it is, and that's the first step to defeating the terrorists once and for all. Hi, everyone. Merry Christmas. I'm Eric Bowling. Welcome to Cashing In. Our Cashing In crew this week, Lisa Booth, Mercedes Schlapp, Rachel Campos-Duffy, and Juan Williams. Welcome, everybody. Now, Mercedes, the first step to winning the war on terror is identifying the enemy. Yes? No? Yes? You know, I think that's something that Donald Trump has done from day one. He made it very clear that we are dealing with terrorists, we're dealing with radical Islamists. This is very different than what we've seen with President Obama, where just recently in an interview he said that he was conflicted on how to deal with the rise of ISIS. And he was surprised that ISIS would be able to land these, have these offenses in a uh, in, in cities like Mosul in Iraq and so I think Eric that it is definitely one of you know it's I think what Donald Trump is doing differently is that he's calling it like it is and I have to say I think that is something that the American people want to want to see I think we are clearly in a moment right now where we need to keep pushing forward on on ensuring that there's this intelligence sharing as well as cyber warfare to be able to stop the mm -hmm. recruitment of ISIS and I think that Donald Trump recognizes that this is going to be one of his top priorities well, let's go on in here first step to to killing the enemy is identifying the enemy no one I don't think we have any trouble knowing who the enemy is the question is is this really going to change anything in terms of actual strategy on the ground? Is this going to kill the enemy any better than we are already doing it? I think that the generals at the Pentagon would tell you, no, this is about rhetoric, and it's about rhetoric that is basically intended as a partisan, uh, partisan red meat, but it has no consequence. It has no substance. Mm -hmm. Lisa? I, I, mm -hmm. You know I want to get in here. I, I completely disagree. Look, the president doesn't understand the threat because he has said so himself. He is the one that called ISIS JV. This is someone who has said that bathtubs are more dangerous than ISIS. This is the rhetoric that he has uh, reiterated throughout his presidency. Not only that, uh, but this is also a president who either is completely naive or intentionally downplaying the threat. He is also, uh, there was allegations that he cooked ISIS terrorism uh, information. Uh, it, you know, and, and so this is a big problem. You also have the Attorney General Loretta Lynch, uh, who redacted information from the 911 calls from the Orlando shooter. So there's been a continued either being incredibly naive or intentionally downplaying the threat. So I'm not quite convinced that President Obama does understand the threat and that we're I'll, facing. I'll, uh, Rachel, I'll give you a real life example how this this PC nature is deadly. You remember the uh, okay. San Bernardino uh, shooting? Well, remember the neighbors yes. of the San Bernardino shooters, and they said, you know, I saw strange mm -hmm. stuff going on, and I knew, you know, but I, but I was concerned because there's a Muslim couple that I would be considered Islamophobic if I call the cops on them, but they were concerned, so they didn't do that. People are dead in the aftermath of that.
Absolutely. Politically, political correctness can kill. And it did in that in that circumstance. We weren't able to capture those people before they went to the um, to the Christmas party that they were invited to. And don't forget also that uh, the press was the first one to say now the family didn't know anything about it. And it was a candidate, Donald Trump, who said, B.S. I mean, these people, there's no way the parents and the family didn't know about this. I'll tell you one other politically correct um, uh, policy of, of Barack Obama's that's killing people in the war on terror, and that is his Guantanamo policy. So right now we have uh, 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 terrorists um, that, we, that we find, and what we're doing is we're droning, we're killing them instead of capturing them because he doesn't want to capture them and fill up the prison in Guantanamo. And what's happening because of that is we're losing really valuable um, interrogation interrogations and human intelligence and another case where political correctness is making us lose the war on terror when we really need to be on the offense on it. No, you know, I, think, I just think you guys need to stop for a second by with throwing out the red meat and say what, what is the difference here? What is it that you would suggest that we do strategically that I has anything it. to do with saying, oh, that's what we call them, I've not that's him, what we call them. The reality I'm is that we as Americans want to defeat terrorists. We need to have allies. We do not want to start a war with all the Muslims in the world. We do not want to start a Nobody's war where we say, saying, that. well, I, I, that's what Juan, a, a minute ago, everybody's saying, no, oh, yeah, this is up. all about President Juan, Obama's failure to say the words I, radical I, Islam. Well, not, 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 no, hold on, guys, I, I, one at a time, not necessarily all about, but certainly it, it would be Juan, a nice fresh start to be able to name the enemy. Mercedes first, and then Lisa. Two things. Under President Obama, it's very clear that it created a vacuum of leadership in the Middle East. That is number one. Number two. One thing that President-elect uh, Trump is pushing for is to ensure that our borders are secure. We're seeing this in Europe right now, where we're seeing the open borders, the situation with, uh, with Merkel right now, where she's let in one million migrants into Germany, where you've seen this latest Berlin terrorist who he, they kept trying to deport him out of Italy. He ended up going to this border-free zone in Germany. This is a control, this is the type of situation that we need to get a control of here in the United States. We're seeing the negative effect that have happened because of open borders in Europe. And I think that Donald Trump is right on in his message. Mercedes, sure you want to damn in all immigrants that and is all, I would say. I do and not. all I political a, refugees a to the United States I'm of America, to our here, land of immigrants. Juan, I am also, saying, I believe in legal immigration. Good, I believe I'm glad that legal to hear that. Oh, let's key. start the there. The question is, you need to ensure that you know who is coming in and out and of this country. And we do. I think that's you a act as if we're a bunch of ignorant people. We don't. There are 11 million immigrants who are not documented. There are Customs people don't do anything. Guys, hang on, hang on, Lisa. Also, that's a bunch of fiction well, because this country who? is the most generous nation in the entire world yes. when it comes to legal immigration. So there's not one person on this panel that is not for legal immigration. But anyways, that's besides the point. Back to Mercedes' point and also to Rachel's point, President Obama has done a lot to hurt this country and make this country more dangerous in the name of legacy. And as Rachel pointed out, Guantanamo Bay is one of them. We know that the worst of the worst is left there, but he has continued committed to his legacy uh, of letting these terrorists out when we know the recidivism rate is at 30 percent, if not higher. And to Mercedes' point as well, he failed to leave a status of forces agreement in Iraq, which gave way to a breeding ground for ISIS. And now we've seen the riots of ISIS. They have at least a branch in, I think, 18 different countries. So in the name of legacy, he has made our country less safe. Let me hear, uh, Rachel. And I would say that it's, well, I would say Donald Trump calling this what it is, um, is not just uh, um, refreshing, it's reassuring. And it's not just Americans, millions of Americans who agree with that. It's also Europeans. Go into the, to the blogs and the comment sections of European papers. They are very much um, dissatisfied with the uh, el elitist, politically correct uh, way of dealing with You know with what, I just want to make Angela one last quick Barack point, Obama. which is that we have a constitution here. And when it comes to locking people up, without taking them to court. Mm. Gee, the Constitution mm. says, mm. not right, mm. illegal. Mm. No, Same no. thing with immigrants. Taking, no, it says taking, citizens. Taking it the it says yeah. 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 No, we also have, we have, have, we have, have, rules, we have Geneva it's Conventions here. Completely Eric. different animal. Geneva Conventions, <laughs> we, we have a Constitution. <laughs> we, if you bring we, them we here, go. they got to go to court. We, and that's what Rachel says. That's why they stay in Guantanamo, Juan. That's exactly the point. Well, that's the point. we got to leave her President Bush, President Bush, President Obama, Republican and Democrat, both Got to go. close it. Got to go. When Watt starts pointing the finger, it's time to go. Got to go. <laughs> we go from celebrating Christmas to celebrating Festivus. How the famous holiday on Seinfeld is being used to air grievances about government waste next. The tradition of Festivus begins 
with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now, you're going to hear about it. Well, who can forget that famous Seinfeld episode about Festivus? George's father tells everyone how they've disappointed him that year. Well, now Senator Rand Paul is celebrating Festivus by airing his grievances over the federal government's waste. One point four billion bucks worth of waste. In fact, here are a few examples. Two and a half million dollars to study what makes the perfect first date. Five hundred thousand dollars to study if smiling in a selfie makes you happier. It probably doesn't. And the most ironic of all, and my favorite, three hundred and seventy-five grand to study if the federal government paying for studies produces better studies. Now, Lisa, you must have some grievances with this, also. No, yeah, exactly. This is a bunch of uh, you know wasteful spending that we just don't need. However, I would like to see the two point five million dollar study to see what makes a great perfect first date. <laughs> well, it could be helpful well, in my dating you? life. <laughs> they, you could be part of the study group. The no, focus but look, group. This, all this stuff is it's, it's little things that really do add up. And look, we're the, we the taxpayers are the ones that are going to end up footing the bill for this ridiculous government spending. And there was an even report not too long ago by the Washington Post of one hundred twenty five billion dollars uh, from Pentagon waste of uh, bearing administrative costs. So there is waste, fraud and abuse that is rampant throughout the government. I really hope that Donald, uh, ele President elect Donald Trump comes in with a wrecking ball to the budgets and, and really just cuts a lot of this stuff out and also tasks or secretaries of various cabinets to cut out waste within their uh, agencies. You know, and, and, and Mercy, we're scrolling through some of these studies. We lost 200, I'm sorry, we lost $29 million worth of cranes uh, and bulldozers in Afghanistan. I mean, th it's amazing. So, and, and Rand Paul points out $1.4 billion. We have a $4 trillion budget. There's a lot of waste going on. Well, I just want to say, I think to my kids, instead of reading twice a night before Christmas, I'm going to read them the waste report by Senator <laughs> Rand Paul, because it is incredibly entertaining, especially when you see that the National Park Service is spending money on identifying uh, the sea monsters in Alaska and uh, and the supernatural events that could happen in that in that area. So it, it, it's mind boggling to me, Eric, that when we have 19 trillion dollars in national debt, when we have a time in a, where we need to be what you call draining the swamp clean cleaning up the bu bureaucracy and looking into this government waste. I mean, I think it's very important for taxpayers to know how our money is being spent. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that we got it. I think for the most part, uh, you know, I, I do think that what he points out, what Senator Paul has been able to do is masterful. And it does explain that the same way that we have Christmas debt, uh, we should make sure that the government doesn't waste all this money on these needless programs. Rachel, too, I, one of the things that just scrolled by, $2 million, two million dollars to send filmmakers to go see their films around the world. Wow, that's, isn't that something they should be doing for themselves? A absolutely. Listen, this list is an insult to the American taxpayer who worked so hard and sent so much money over to the federal government. And when Donald Trump talked about draining the swamp, um, I think he also meant draining the swamp of the bureaucrats and the politicians that are okaying and giving the green light on projects like this. And I think it's also important to note that this is money that's not going to cure cancer. Um, if you are somebody who deeply cares about um, really important research and believes the government has a role in that, then you ought to get on board. Look at what um, look at what uh, uh, Senator Rand Paul has has this list of, of wasteful projects. Get on board. Call your congressmen. Call your senators and work with the government um, officials and elected officials to get rid of this wasteful spending. It well, is absolutely well, let, the reason why we're going to cut projects that then they'll say we absolutely need. Let's get the the, the liberal in here. Who liberals love to spend? Juan, you must have some problem with some of these, no? No, you know what? I think this is this is so petty and a distraction. Petty. This this is a Christmas oh stunt. Petty. This is a very interesting Christmas stunt because the reality is the big waste in government is places like the Pentagon. But you guys don't want to talk to the generals Donald about Trump wasting did. money. Sure. Oh, I'm all Pentagon. for it. Or Trump you guys, is. you guys don't want to deal with. And this this is something Rachel was just touch, touching on. So much of the innovation in this country, including the internet, comes from government research. So important Not this research, kind of government important research, research at places like NIH and others get a squished date? because we waste money so rampantly in this country. These things are small. Oh, Why boy. don't you guys you really get serious limit, and talk about big small? waste in America? Conservatives, two million dollars. Conservatives two were million. cheering. Conservatives were cheering when when Donald Trump um, called out Boeing for the price of that airplane. I think we've got a CEO who understands the business, understands the bottom line, and I think he's going to take uh, 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 an axe 
um, to use my husband's phrase, um, to a lot of these this wasteful spending. And it should be in the Pentagon, but it also needs to be at the NIH and all these other uh, so uh, departments areas, that are Rachel, okay so these right. wasteful there are, projects. There are so many areas that we can, we can cut back on some of the waste, fraud, and abuse, and some of the spending. By the way, Lisa, how about this? They could have combined two. They could have said selfies on first dates, and then they could have saved half the money. <laughs> well, then you're not going to get a second date, so there's no, re there's no reason to research the That's second date. And then we know. <laughs> well, then, then you have your answer. Coming up, MTV making a video telling white guys what the resolutions should be for 2017. Rachel's a former star of MTV's The Real World. Is she okay with this? MTV facing well-deserved backlash after releasing a video telling white guys what their New Year's resolutions should be. Take a look and notice the cheap shot at Fox News. First off, try to recognize that America was never great for anyone who wasn't a white guy. Can we all just agree that Black Lives Matter isn't the opposite of All Lives Matter? Black Lives just matter. There's no need to overcomplicate it. Also, Blue Lives Matter isn't a thing. Learn what mansplaining is? and then stop doing it. Oh, and if you're a judge, don't prioritize the well-being of an Ivy League athlete over the woman he assaulted. We all love Beyonce, and yeah, she's black, so of course she cares about black issues. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Fox News. Ooh, so what's going on in MTV? Let's ask someone who might know. Rachel, we're putting up some photos of you starring on the MTV show, The Real World. So is your former <laughs> network out of line? Of those photos, I heart the 90s, right? Um, <laughs> listen, here's... <laughs> Here's the here's the deal. Um, their ratings are down. That's what's happening at MTV, and it's because of ham-handed attempts by um, suits up at Viacom who think this is really cool and hip and really don't know what is. Um, they underestimate youth. Um, they always have. Uh, the millennials are a lot more dynamic, by the way, a lot more pro-life than a lot of these liberal elites think they are. Um, and there was a time back in the early 90s and, and, and in the 80s when MTV was very interesting. It was countercultural. It had groundbreaking shows like The Real world that I was on that put people from different backgrounds together and, and, and tried to see if they could find uh, common ground. But there is one lesson I learned on MTV, Eric, and it's a lesson I learned over and over and over again, even now in my 40s, and that is the myth of liberal tolerance. Um, when I lived in that house, um, my, I was far more open-minded um, and interested in the lives of my liberal roommates than they ever were about mine, and uh, that's why we see uh, um, this kind of divisive identity politics type video that you see right now on MTV. Well, let's go to Juan. Juan, I saw in that, that montage that we played a couple of clips that we pulled out. One was uh, the woman saying, and she quoted, America's only great if you're white. Your thoughts on this, this, this video, by the way? Well, I think the video is kind of condescending and arrogant. I don't, I don't know what the point is because the people who are putting it out, I guess, intended to draw in millennials. Well, millennials overwhelmingly voted for Hillary Clinton, so I don't know what. The, so I, it strikes me as an advertising gimmick to pl pander uh, to young people. I don't know that it says anything to people who don't like it. It ends up here at Fox News as uh, you know, fodder for people to condemn liberals. So I, it seems self-defeating to Let me. Let me stay with you for one second. I, I coined it uh, victimization propaganda. I, it really is like a propaganda film. Yeah. Well, no, but I mean, what, what the first lady, you asked me about, you know, yeah, is it true? Yeah. Uh, America was great. Well, yeah, it was great. If you go back, let's make America great again, which was President like Trump's campaign slogan. Gee, imagine if you weren't a white male, you could be a white woman even and have some strong objections to that. Yeah. Now, at least MTV pulled that video down. Probably for obvious reasons, they're Absolutely. probably getting too much backlash. Absolutely. Look, this is completely outlandish, and I really think there's a danger in the left and among the media elite, really, in this continued unnecessary labeling of racism and applying that word where it does not need to be applied, because the reality is it, it devalues the word. It loses its po potency. Uh, and also what you end up doing is you alienate uh, people that are willing and want to have a substantive and meaningful conversation. And I think that's what we've seen from the left in, in sort of this cultural push uh, that this video, and so it rightfully got pulled down here. And Mercy, uh, gender politics, gender, uh, I don't even know what you call it, gender propaganda, uh, gender culture seems to be on its way out. I mean, gender and 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 race. I, I mean, they, everyone made a big thing about it in, in, in the aftermath of Donald Trump winning winning resoundingly. Maybe this stuff is it's time to usher this out. Oh, absolutely. I do have to say, I I miss I do miss the days of watching Rachel on Real World and our own uh, Fox Business <laughs> Kennedy, who would be like the host on MTV back in the day. You know, it really is unfortunate that we've gotten to the point. 
uh, and I'm actually kind of depressed about it, that we're not inspiring our youth uh, to think beyond just the color of one's skin. It's like what Dr. Martin Luther King said, it would, we should be thinking about the content of one's character. And I wish that we could, they, the, the youth could view America as being this great exceptional land that we are, that fights for freedom, that fights for democracy, that we're able to state our opinions. And I think that being able to teach our, our children that, the, uh, I think is such a critical part of what parents have to do. Unfortunately, our schools are failing us on that. Uh, but I mean, we're getting to a point, Eric, that uh, moving aside from gender, moving aside from uh, color, it's about a, a great America, and that's what we should all be striving for. Uh, you know, I've got to say, okay. my problem with and, this whole segment and, is I think these three women are so young that that's why they're talking like this, because they're saying as if somehow they're talking to millennials. <laughs> I think you guys are very young and quite wonderful. Merry Christmas. We'll, we'll take it. <laughs> and, 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 uh, so, so what is it, Rachel? You, you, you started MTV and then you grow up and then you come, come grow over. Grow up. She's, she's, she's still a kid. She's still a kid. With some I, sense, I, I you come to Vox. I was always a conservative on that. On I was always a conservative on MTV, but I think what, the, the heartening thing about this is they took it down. Right. They were ridiculed for it. I think identity politics is so 2008. Yeah, so 2008. Um, I think people are moving <laughs> So back on. then, so back and, then. Um, Guys, I gotta go, Rachel. I'm sorry, I gotta go. I'm running out of time. Coming up, who we should really be thankful for today as we celebrate Christmas. I want to say thanks and Merry Christmas to our cash and crew for joining us. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. All right, time to wake up, America. I want to wish everyone a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy Hanukkah as well. And as always, please remember those who keep us safe, our heroes in the military and our heroes in blue. Have a wonderful and safe weekend, everybody.